announcement that the meeting is being recorded. Uh, public comments. Well, I would have, have, did you send out the municipal sign on letter that I sent to you? For H2810? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's actually on the agenda. Oh, it's on the agenda. Well, I'm just going to say that besides asking you personally to sign on, um, I'm not that confident in the coalition's ability to reach out to a, enough community. So if you guys, I bet you have friends that are city, you know, municipal officials in other towns that, so feel free to forward it to others to sign. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> Adele? Okay, I'll speak. Um, I had hoped to pop something up on here, but I think, I think I'm just going to do it verbally um, since Wayne worked so hard to get his presentation <laughs> already. So I'm not going to throw it No, this is, this is uh, public comment period. Public comment period. Yes, yeah, so I am gonna, I'm on the agenda later. My name is Lily Lombard. I live on Monroe Street. Um, but I'm, I want to use a little time in my public comment to also share... I know it's going to be on the agenda to discuss the climate plan, and um, I wasn't altogether clear from Chris whether or not the public is invited to be part of that discussion. So I thought that I would use my public comment period to share with you um, some of the updated comments that the Tree Commission um, will be submitting regarding the climate plan. We thought about it a lot. I'm going to give everybody a one-page summary, but there are 10 pages of comments mostly very detailed information about how the role of urban forestry can be better inserted into the plan. But I did want to share that we have been doing some sort of 30,000 foot uh, level thinking about this plan and in the context of the city's goals and the city's master planning. And so I wanted to share those. I'm going to distribute those for your interest. Um, and I thought I would read them to you because I feel they're important and I, want, I, I would love for um, it to be, um, to go into some of your deliberation today. So here, here it goes. And I do want to begin with the caveat that if Wayne has since updated the plan, I'm, I don't know that. Um, so this is based on the plan that, that we saw, um, you know, the version that we saw back in late August, early September. So, um, you know, we, we, we find the plan hard, hard to read and to navigate and pretty jargon filled. And um, that made it a little hard to process. So for, for someone who actually meticulously went through the 90 some pages, it was a hard task. What I think uh, our overwhelming uh, question was how this, this particular plan is going to somehow be an arm to the larger master plan that is undergoing review in 2020. That wasn't clear to us. It, it, um, it, as far as we know, climate change is going to be affecting every facet of every um, you know, department in the city here forward. And so it makes sense that any master plan be infused with recommendations regarding um, climate change planning. Um, resilience planning, adaptation, mitigation. So it, we questioned whether it made sense to have this be some kind of uh, accessory to the master plan, or rather it made sense to have this seamlessly incorporated into the master planning process in 2020. So that, that was what was an overarching feeling. And then the other one, this, the third bullet point down, was that like I heard some points come, uh, raised at the end of the last um, NESC meeting, we, we realize the urgency of this matter is just tr tremendous and that the largest emission reductions have to take place in the next 10 years if we're going to you know, stem the tide of climate change. And so the master plan covers a 10-year period. So it made the most sense to us that the master plan um, have, be a very uh, detailed uh, sort of blueprint for how we get to 45% emissions reduction over the next 10 years. And that has to include specific metrics, timetables, goals, um, methods of evaluation, that sort of thing. So that, you know, that is an overarching point, is that we just can't let go of this, of this very strong 
feeling that this um, plan needs to have teeth. Um, and then the last one is really related to urban forestry. And, um, and so uh, if you're interested in, in the detailed remarks that we, um, we provided, I'm happy to share those with you. Basically, we came up with some very specific metrics or examples of very specific metrics. So we do feel like uh, those can be generated and, and, you know, there's lots of different ways to do it, but, um, you know, different departments, different commissions weighing in, but that we all should be uh, very active in that, that process of, of pinning ourselves down to some clear metrics. So that's, that's my comment regarding the climate plan. The other thing that I wanted to share with, with the co uh, committee is that, um, as you know, uh, Columbia Gas is now, um, <laughs> been forced to um, stop all gas works. It, it, this has been in the news, and it's related to um, their incompetency once again in dealing with um, fixing gas leaks in Lawrence. And so the DPU sl slapped a moratorium on them for um, addressing any gas leaks other than emergency gas leaks. And, um, you know, how does that relate to here in Northampton? Well, Northampton has some of the oldest gas pipes underneath its streets of, you know, anywhere in the, in the Commonwealth. It's, you know, we have that. We have a very, very aging, mostly cast iron uh, pipe system. And we have leaks all the time. And I had the, um, the privilege about three weeks ago of uh, traveling through a small segment of Northampton with a um, professional gas detector, someone who's been in the business for 40 years in detecting gas leaks. Um, he, in fact, he became a whistleblower for the utility companies. His name is Bob Ackley um, uh, because he found a very strong correlation between gas leaks and trees and uh, tree damage, tree asphyxiation from gas leaks. So um, what, in this tiny little three hour window, what we found in an area where um, the, the state or, or the Columbia Gas had, had mapped out nine uh, leaks that were un, um, had not been yet repaired, uh, we found about double that. And we found one grade one leak, which um, if you don't know anything about the way they grade gas leaks, uh, grade one is at risk of explosion because gas is building up in a closed space and we found one in a manhole at 10 percent uh, we found a grade two leak which is a serious leak but not a grade one um, within the root zone of a tree uh, a, a newly planted tree suggesting that um, you know we're throwing good money after bad by planting trees in zones where there are gas leaks and then we found numerous other what would be considered grade three leaks, which the gas companies really have no um, no incentive whatsoever to uh, to repair. Um, so I just bring this to the attention of the committee that um, we we uh, methane is a, a very potent greenhouse gas that is leaking all the time out of our streets um, and our, our catch basins. I have a, uh, I have a catch basin from my house that's been smelling of gas for the entire fifteen years I've been there. And I've had the gas company come out about 10 times to try to identify where the gas leak went, and they never have been able to. So um, I just wanted to bring that to your attention um, and share it with the Tree Commission. I share it with the Department of Public Works, and I thank the list worthy of sharing with you all. So. <coughs> thank all right. you, Willie. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so before I call for a motion on the minutes, I want you guys know that we are swapping the order for um, Lily's presentation later on. Uh, and the climate resilience and the generation plan because of Lily's request. Um, so let's get to the minutes and then we will focus on climate resilience and regeneration until about 5.15. And when Lily takes time to swap out the, um, uh, the displays up on the screen up there, we're gonna have a very, very quick discussion on the last agenda item. Okay. Uh, I'll move to accept the minutes. There we go, motion, motion's Second. been seconded. Any comments? Mm -hmm. Actually, I had one given to me already that we are going to change the resolving fund to the revolving fund. That's a script, sir. <laughs> uh, but given that change, um, as amended. As amended, there we go. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any more discussion? Approved. Okay. Um, Wayne, uh, it is yours. <laughs> so I want to give sort of a few slides or introductions to sort of set the stage. I've been talking about this briefly before. 
but I just sort of wanted to make sure we're all in the same, same place. So just sort of remember going back to 2008, the city adopted the sustainable under handling plan. Um, we typically think of master plans have a 20 year planning horizon. Doesn't mean you shouldn't revise the plan within 20 years, but we sort of think we're, we're planning after 20 years. And so this logo up there is sort of what came out of the plan of saying, you know, sustainability is about, you know, the balance, the, the you know, uh, environment, social equity, uh, and economy, you can't look at them in isolation. And a lot of things came out of that plan. You know, Chris's position has been vacant for a long time, it's been drafted differently, came out of the plan. Um, a lot of things the city's done, a lot of infill, where we sort of doubled and tripled the allowable density through walking distance to downtown, a whole series of things. Um, the, the reason I want to talk about plan recently is, is some of the comments that you all have received are about how deep in the weeds do you go? And I think the part of the plan that's been really important has been sort of bigger framework issues, um, and not so much, you know, the appendix for the exact zoning that should come out of the plan. Um, and so that's sort of what's been the, the memory of those things. Um, the, the, we looked at the plan, I guess, four years ago now to say, okay, we want to start thinking about what do we need to to revise the plan? And we did an assessment of what was strong about the plan, what was weak about the plan. We previously given you a presentation on Star Communities, which was the instrument that we used to, to assess the plan. And we identified sort of three things kind of plan that were weakest. We didn't think social equity was as strong as it could be. And we've been doing a lot of things since then, sort of incorporating social equity into a lot of different actions. We thought walk, walking and biking wasn't as strong, and so we did a separate walk-bike plan so we could do sort of a laser focus on that with a plan to actually bring that into the, the overall comprehensive plan. And then the, the climate resilience and regeneration. So the idea is these are freestanding documents so we could focus on them and then we get back to the plan and revise the state. So for now it'll be a freestanding document just like walk bike is. Um, you know, we've already spent I think half a million dollars based on recommendations coming out of walk bike Northampton plan. So we, you know we take these plans very seriously. Um, we assume this would be the same thing. Freestanding things for a document eventually gets incorporated in. Revising the plan is probably going to slow down a bit, just in terms of other things that we have to do. I think we're currently projecting completing a revised sustainable plan in 2022, probably starting in 2021 and completing it in 2022. Um, and so we want to make sure that we, you know, we don't put these other things on hold while we get back to that. You mean calendar year or fiscal year? Calendar year. <clears throat> Again, you know, we, we've never had, unlike things that are grant driven, we don't, and there's no, there's no expiration date for the plan, there's targets when we do it. So we want to have enough time for discussion. You know, so this plan is a good example. We had hoped you guys would act in early September. You want more time, which is absolutely fine, but it just makes projections for times always difficult. But 2022 is our, is our guess, sort of like figuring we start in late 20. 20, or you know, early 2021, year and a half process to do the process. But, you Can know. you just clarify again for me the difference between what we're evaluating now and that plan that you're talking about? Today? So in Massachusetts, there's a bill planning to change that, but in Massachusetts right now, comprehensive plans are adopted by the planning board. Mm -hmm. It does two things. One is it has some regulatory teeth. When people come before the planning board for certain permits, the criteria says conformance with the city's comprehensive plan. So it has some regulatory teeth. And then it's also just sort of a vision for where we want to go. For my office in particular, because we're the ones who sort of manage the plan, it's sort of a blueprint for most of the things that we do come out of the plan. For other departments, frankly, it's really up to each department. So we make recommendations for other departments, and some departments use a lot, and some departments use it less. City Council's paid a lot of attention to the plan. You know, so it varies across the board. Even yes, like we have school departments are very independent. Um, and so we make recommendations for education and you know they fit in, in with everything else. Um, other departments are more integrated into the city government structures. Do you feel that the school department and all these other departments would be independent when it comes to energy policy? So on the education side, yes. And, they, and school departments done amazing things to sustainability. This isn't criticism of them. But they're sort of doing their own 
curriculum planning. They're doing an enormous number of things. Oh, you I, know. I, I apologize for not being clear. I'm talking about like maintenance and. No, maintenance is, is part of central. I mean, central services covers both yeah. city side and school side. Okay. So I'm sorry, it's really education yeah. side. Okay. Okay. Market, I'm sure that makes um, uh, so we so we do both comprehensive plans and strategic plans. The way the planning boards adopt these plans is that we have this overall comprehensive plan. They adopt this comprehensive plan, and then we do other things and adopt it as an element of the comprehensive plan. So this would have the same legal teeth as the sustainable New Hampshire plan, but it's not integrated together. You almost starting right now for walking, biking, for example. You need to look at both documents mm. together. So that's the same thing. You have to look at both documents. Um, so that's sort of the overall piece, but I just want to come back to this because everything we do, even in resilience regeneration, we're still using these three E's. So, you know, we know, for example, that you can do a lot of stuff about solar panels. I mean, this committee's talked about this. Solar panels on roofs that leave low-income individuals, particularly renters, behind. Um, and we know the first people who are affected by climate change are the jargon is frontline communities, the communities who can least evacuate and least able to deal with those things. And so that same three E's has to fit in in the context of resilience and regeneration. And so one of the things we have to do when we take this from a independent plan to bring into the conference plan is, is thinking about all those things. Um, so that's sort of just, it's not working. Okay. So, um, this is just, you know, we, we often, as this group, I think I showed you this slide before, we've often talked in terms of mitigation and adaptation. And you can think of resiliency being similar to mitigation and regeneration being similar, I'm sorry, resilience being similar to adaptation and resiliency, um, resilience for adaptation, uh, regeneration for mitigation. From our standpoint, they're not exactly the same, which is why we've used different terms. So one of the things that's important about resiliency is climate resiliency, but also generally being a resilient community, right? So disruptions because of interruption of power supplies because of climate change may not be that different than disruptions we caught from economic changes, you know, in terms of what does it take to be a more resilient community. Likewise, regeneration of how do we deal with invasive plants that are taking over all our natural systems isn't necessarily considered part of mitigation, but it's part of what we need to do. So we just use these broader terms, um, and, and I guess from our standpoint, we're thinking of regeneration as being the step beyond sustainability, right? So we don't want to just freeze things so they aren't being sustainable, we want things to get to get better. Um, it's sort of a minor point process. I, one thing that's really key that we keep coming back to in everything we did in Sustainable in Hampton that we want as this plan comes in is we don't just want to survive climate change, right? We want to thrive in light of climate change. So everything we do, we think about, you know, how, does, how do these goals fit our overall community goals? Um, and how do we deal with our resiliency actions and our regeneration actions, make this a better community? So I, I think I mentioned this last meeting, but I did a planning project in Provincetown. And Provincetown cares about resilience and they care about regeneration and they're going to be a great community but they may not be a great community for anybody who's born there right second lowest in average income in the entire state um which you wouldn't see this is a year of wealth and people who are born there are being forced out and so we don't want that to happen we don't want to just be resilient for somebody else and so that's that's back to the economic element and that's back to thinking about all the different goals that we have as a community it shouldn't just be in one box i, mean, I think the city has deliberately said sustainability is a function of cuts across city offices. Right? Some cities say, here's sustainability functions. And then everybody else says, oh, I'm not going to worry about this because here's sustainability functions. But we have DPW worries about sustainability, particularly recycling and stormwater. And Chris does energy, and, and we do alternative transportation. We do the frameworks. And, and I think that's important to have it integrated into everything that we do in the process. And so you'll see more of that later. Um, this is just sort of the equity. I just want to be clear that often we focus on equity. People talk about who gets the goodies, um, you know, who suffers and who doesn't suffer. Um, and we just want to be clear there's different definitions of equity. So we don't want to just be planning for low income individuals, but planning with. Um, so I, you know, I just tell you one personal story. I was in, in Rio de Janeiro last week on a planning project there. And um, we were invited to deal with sort of 
had to meet the needs for some of the, the poorest individuals in, this, in a redone port area. And sponsors were great, and they didn't bring a single person from the favela, the, the informal settlement, into the process. So we sort of had to leave the meeting, go off to the favela, and, and involve people into the discussion process for doing it. And so even though powers that be were thinking about distributional equity, they weren't thinking about these other forms of equity. Uh, and so again, that, that's, that, those are sort of one of the, the themes we try to get through here and need to bring in more. Like, again, it's one of the things that was weaker in the same or Hampton project a few years ago. Um, you can't see this, but you all looked at the plan, lots of detailed comments. So I'm not, you know, I'm really not doing a line by line for the plan, but you see sort of the graph on the right. The consultants tried to assign different actions for different things, resiliency, regeneration, social equity. Um, and the only point of this is things cut across. We, we nice, like putting things in nice neat boxes. This is about mitigation. This is about, you know, whatever. This is about equity. But, but everything cuts across different categories. And so we're trying to get as many of those cross-cutting actions as we can in the process. Um, and I, this is in some ways, I, you probably can't read the print from here, but this is in some ways one of the most important things is I think there's a risk when we're doing a plan to go so deep in the weeds we lose the bigger picture. So we have necessity, we have stormwater DPW, we have zoning in my office, we have you know, the, the policies for looking at energy sources for city buildings. We just, what the point of the plan isn't to be incredibly deep in the weeds about any one of these actions. It's to have a, a framework that connects everything together. So when I buy open space, for example, we think about open space as, among other things, a way to preserve trees to make sure that we're having carbon sequestration. Some of you know our big purchase for this year is gonna be a 105 acre parcel of former golf course that we want to re-vegetate. It's going to create an enormous amount of, you know, a carbon sink. We want to get both the soil is really depleted and the trees are 10% coverage, 20% coverage. Um, and so even though it's an open space action, it relates to uh, both regeneration and, and resiliency. Uh, there's a lot of downstream flooding from the golf course because the golf course basically doesn't have a floodplain. They filled in the floodplain, the water goes through the stream and it races down and, and creates a lot of erosion and that's all it runs properly. So the point of this is the, the most important part of the plan isn't tinkering with specific goals for open space. It's about creating an overall framework so every time we buy open space, every time we do any of these actions, we come back to what those overall goals are in the process. And so that, that framework is, is the important part. So just sort of a couple of frameworks to think about. You know, we just did, we cheated, we used the same logo for sustainability, but this is, you know, the thrive with, with chronic stress and the, the thrive with acute stress. This is from Rockefeller Foundation, 100 Resilient Cities. It's the sort of thing that they've done for what resiliency means. Um, and so we think in terms of those, those things. So acute stress is what gets the news, wildfires in California, you know, hurricanes in the Southeast, um, all of which we obviously want to thrive in light of those things. The chronic stress at times what we doesn't get enough attention. So heat waves, you know, a little more rain than we used to get, a few more, not necessarily a hurricane, but a few more storms that are three inches in 24 hours, those kinds of things. Uh, and so how do we deal with those things? And then a community health one. Again, you know, this is think about things like <coughs> increased Lyme disease or mosquitoes that, that, that now are living in Northampton that couldn't survive through the winters 10 years ago or 20 years ago. How do we deal with all those things in sort of overall pile? And that community health is particularly one that has to do with social equity. We know that there's different health outcomes for different people in the community. Um, and so we're trying to pay attention to all those things in the process. Um, and then generally, because for us, so much of the challenge is about storms and changing storms, we've kicked off this program, Designs with Nature, we first had a $400,000 grant to look at opportunities to catch stormwater. So this is not about energy and carbon, that's not the other part of resiliency. So we had a $400,000 grant to look at stormwater. We just got a tentative approval for a $262,000 grant to start implementing the first grant to do some um, restoration ice pond site off of Route 66. We're gonna apply for another grant this year to help do some more of the planning for the, the golf course restoration. Um, we're going to be using some of our tree mitigation money to plant trees in the golf course and other places. So sort of those, that designs of nature fits in on both climate and non-climate forms of fabrication. And again, we're sort of trying to build on the plan for, for these types of things. Um, 
things. Um, and you know, I think, I think I showed this slide before, but you know, we, we also got a grant last year for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I think, to look at our dikes. The flight control dikes that were built in 1939 and 1940 probably don't meet current standards. Um, if we do nothing in the next five years, all of Pleasant Street and Lower Main Street is going to be classified as a floodplain, which would mean that basically shut down any development. The floodplain standards are much stricter. So we need to look at the dikes. Um, the EPA has already been looking at the pumps, the 1940 pumps, um, but the dikes themselves, so we'll be drilling lots of holes in the dikes, seeing in a big storm as water slip under the dikes. Um, and this is when I, when I talk about things that come out of a plan, your question was the plan do. Even though it's in draft stage, when we applied for that $350,000 grant, we said, you know, we identified in our municipal vulnerability program that our dikes aren't up to snuff, and in our draft plan, we've identified a specific action. Um, and so, and then the new grant we're applying for the golf course comes out of it. And so there's sometimes the most immediate things are those big picture things that don't sound that meaningful, right? We need to look at the dikes and think about the dikes, right? That's not deep in the weeds, but that directly led us to get $15,000 last year, I hope, or this year. So those big picture things are in some ways the immediate take homes for us. What's um, the 600 feet? Is that, what was that image you had, 600 feet equals $2 million? Oh, so um, we had a MassWorks grant that helped make it possible to do the lumberyard project that Dallas CDC did. And we had to replace 600 feet of stormwater. Now, it's a huge stormwater pipe. Six foot high pipe, built 140 years ago, 150 years ago. Um, we spent $2 million to replace 600 feet of pipe. Now, it has about as big as cost you get, massive pipe. We had to hold the railroad so the railroad wouldn't collapse in. So there's a lot of railroad flaggers. There's lots of extra costs that don't apply. But the point is, with climate, we can't keep up with maintaining our existing infrastructure with no climate change. We certainly couldn't go through and replace every stormwater pipe in the city. And so we need to think about how. There's some dung rooms are always a hybrid. Lots of pipes have to be replaced. There's no question. You're saying millions of dollars in the next 100 years of pipe replacement. But we need to catch water as much as we can beforehand. So Smith College, again using this plan, Smith College is doing a master landscaping plan. And we said, there's about 10% of Smith College campus, a very small amount, that's right on the edge of two watersheds. The Mill River watershed to the west and the historic Mill River watershed that goes through downtown. We said, when you're doing a project, when you're doing a new roof on College Hall, which is right on the cusp of the, the thing, can you send the water to the west instead of sending it to the east? Right? This isn't a massive water transfer. But you know, College Hall literally you can send the water to the front of the building or the back of the building. Let's move it to the back of the building. So that's the kind of thing that comes out of this on we can't take more water downtown, we can take more water in the Mill River, and we send a little bit more water in that direction. We think about those kinds of things in the process. Um, so um, the thing on the right, the graphic's much easier to plan, but so we've had a series of frameworks. So the, the mayor committed us to the Global Covenant of Mayors. We may get kicked out um, because Global Covenant of Mayors includes a commitment two years to have lots more metrics and lots more um, data, which we don't have. And so this goes back to Lily's comment. I, I love metrics. I think it's wonderful. I'd love to have the data. But the question is, we're not a rich city. Where do we use our limited resources? How important is it? So we're going through discussion. You know, how important is it to be part of global government mayors? If we have, you know, unless we get an increase in staff, which both Chris and I would like, every time we're doing better data on greenhouse gas emissions, we're doing less work on something different. And so, you know, some people have defined defined planning as the prioritization of scarce resources. So data metrics, all that stuff's wonderful. But to me, it's the priorities. If it moves us along, it's wonderful. If it slows us down, it's not. Um, I just wanted to say that I can appreciate your desire to not get lost in the weeds on this plan, but that it is my feeling, and it was reflected by Lily's comments earlier, that there is an enormous amount of improvement that could be made to this before it's adopted. And there is also a significant amount of expertise that b belongs to this commission. And I hope that the city plans to take very seriously the recommendations that we're going to make 
and is willing to give us the time to actually go through it. So, so that's the reason of this conversation. We want to hear other recommendations. Um, this, I think I, the I, pushback I, is... Well, I apologize. I have enough comments to, to discuss for about an hour. Yeah, okay. So I think the pushback is the result, if we do too far, is we're not going to do the frameworks. We're going to put it on hold because we just don't have the resources, we don't have the bandwidth to do a lot of things. And so we need to think as a committee, and the planning board who ultimately adopts it needs to think as a committee, what's the best use of limited resources? Um, and I think that's just the reality. We don't have money more for consultants, so we're now we're taking over the process. So we'll go through the comments, but that's... Is there an opening for us to assist with rewriting this? We're, well, we wanted to detail comments, we'll look at it, you know, what can we bring in and not. I think, you know, we had several hundred people involved in the process, and we had a process involved, and I think we're very cautious about who who's at the table when you, they weren't at the table in that process. So we worked hard engaging low-income individuals, for example. And so we do worry about how do we make sure we, if we're not going to open up that conversation again, I just think we want to be careful. Yeah. Having people give us detailed language that we can look at to bring in or not, yes, is very useful. But no, we're not going to pass over the files. My, right. My thought was only that the people that are on this committee are here in volunteer, voluntary capacity, and that I would be happy to volunteer my time to assist and to improve language that I think needs to be strengthened. Yeah, I think that's great. That's why we're here. But I, I just I don't want to underestimate how much time that takes in the process. So well, uh, staff uh, time as well as yes, volunteer. Let, 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 let we continue with that, okay? And so what do we get to? Bring the comments in. Yeah, I mean that's that's the point of it. We want to get all your comments and, and talk about each one. But, um, but I think we want. I think we we had comments from the public process, and there was a formal process for that. And now it's at a committee level, and so I think we want to have those discussions at the committee level. We can go through each individual comment and sort of talk about what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And what's, what's what are the repercussions? What's the time frame set by the end of the year? Kind of well, that's what we wanted because the council because some councils were involved who aren't going to be here before. Again, that because the grant's over, there's no deadline. It, it slows down on the things. That, you know, just as one example, we have a hazard mitigation plan that is um, was it runs out August of next year. If we don't revise that plan, we're not eligible for millions of dollars of grants. We got about six million dollars of grants in the last time period based on that thing. So that has to go ahead. So if we don't make certain times. This gets put on hold, but there's no legal requirement for this to get done. But two and a half months, and it's the end of the year, still a couple months away. Yeah, yeah, but you know, we're meeting once a month, and so all that stuff. So, um, I, I just know. I mean, I, I think the window for council is closing rapidly because we're not. We haven't done anything since your last meeting because we want to wait for your comments. We're not going to do anything until we are comfortable here. Then we go to planning board, and then we go to city council. So the window in terms of count, time for council is close. Okay, it's not natural. Mm -hmm. Can we ask a, a retrospective question? You uh, mentioned that we don't have uh, the metrics for the uh, to remain the, potentially to remain in the global covenant of mayors. Yeah, is that partly? I understand that there's staff limitations, but is it partly because they weren't written in initially to the 2008 sustainability plan? No, and this is so the greenhouse gas. Didn't actually collect the information? This isn't from that. This is the greenhouse gas inventory. So that's a much more recent piece. So we had an intern do a greenhouse gas inventory for us three years ago-ish, at least at the time. And then the consultants here polished it up a little bit. Um, we didn't get industrial sector. National Grid only gives information at certain levels. We had to use models for oil and uh, for gasoline. Uh, and so it's just, it's not a perfect data. Um, and the question is, what data do we need to, we need enough data to drive our decisions. Do we need data to, to drive? Maybe we just sit, focus on city operations. So I guess my reason for asking that is because if we're not writing in the metrics now, we, I think we were at risk of <clears throat> kind of recreating that issue. If you don't actually build them into the plan as it's being written, you're not creating the systems and all of the, the different you know, sectors of government to actually collect that data in, a, in some kind of systematic way. Yes, but I guess the question is, is the, there's two ways to do it. One is have the data for the plan, which I, you know, with enough resources is great to do it. 
The other is just saying one of the actions to the plan is collecting that data. And that's typically the way we've done it. Lots of things we do. The plan says, big picture, here's the framework. We need to beef up our, our greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And then we use that to ask the mayor for money through capital improvements or through grants or through other kinds of things. So talking about what the metric should be, absolutely, I agree with. Having them before you do a plan, that's the part I'm pushing back and saying, I'm not sure. Let me finish going through this and maybe I, I come back to them. So, so anyway, so you know in terms of the regeneration framework, so when the mayor committed to global covenants of mayor, he committed to an 80% greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2050, which is the Paris Accords. Then a year later, when we kicked off the regeneration plan, he committed to being carbon neutral by 2050. And so part of what we're trying to say is, you know, what is the roadmap to get there? You know, the fact that Smith is committed to be carbon neutral by 2030 is part of the roadmap. But Smith, even though they get a lot of press for being carbon neutral, is primarily focused on their thermal loads, not staff driving to work and not the, the other impacts that they have. So we're not really getting there. Isn't that sensible, though, since that's all we have control over and we have such direct control over that? You know, lots of places are looking at everything. You know, we when Smith built the um, Ford Hall, we, so we have this... We have a parking requirement for Smith. We don't, it's a weird thing. We actually don't want them to buy parking. But we have a parking requirement. It brings them to the table. And when they build Ford Hall to save themselves $5 million in new garage, they raise the parking fees for staff from, I think it was $12 to $120. They paid for bike lanes on the road. They brought Zipcar to Northampton. Um, and that's, so they have enormous influence over their staff. It's limited. Obviously, they control their buildings more than their staff. But if, you know, what if they raise parking rates two hundred dollars? What if they gave people, you know, ten thousand dollars towards an electric vehicle? I'm assuming they should do that. Northampton, a city, would love to do that. <laughs> be nice. But I'm just saying, take it if right. It. Lots of places <laughs> do focus on the total environmental footprint, right? Um, well, which I think is 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 to be applauded. I'm just, but my concern, I guess, is more of a technician as always that we aggressively pursue to achieve the things that we easily can. Right, right, right. And so that, that also comes back to the plan is, as a city, we could focus just on city operations, which we have the most control over, uh, we have the least control over the city. So one of the discussions is how aggressive is our work, and you see this on the other slide, but how aggressive, you know, we can be incredibly aggressive at city buildings to the extent we don't have resources, but there's some things, you know, our president's trying to cut out the national standards for, for fuel emissions. We don't really control that. We don't control, you know, the interstate traffic that goes through. And so, what do we call it? We can meet any standard if we leave things out. I, I was in New Zealand for a project once. And New Zealand, I was in, in Auckland, and they were doing this wonderful thing about we want to be carbon neutral in this wonderful plan. This is 12 years ago. They were sort of leading the, the world. And then they had a little asterisk in the plan that said, well, you know, to fly anywhere, you're flying a long way from Auckland. And so we're going to leave out the emissions of the international airport, even though that's 50% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then as a country, they said, our economy is driven around uh, producing food. We're going to leave out agriculture. So New Zealand is like this amazing, almost carbon neutral country, except international flights and agriculture, which is like well over half their footprint. You know, so you just got to figure out, which is maybe okay, but we just need to have that conversation where we're trying to get in, and we haven't had that yet. So, you know, we do have this greenhouse gas emissions. I, I don't want to. I don't want to bash it. I think we have some really good data that helps. It helps us say, you know, we have an understanding. So, for example, you know, if you go talk to sixth graders about sustainability, they are going to say we need to recycle. Recycling is incredibly important. I think recycling is incredibly important. But in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, it's actually a tiny percentage of what we do. And so, you know, we have some data that helps us understand where's our energy use and how we're doing it. And so even though our greenhouse gas emission is incredibly flawed, frankly, when I talk to my peers, a lot of people's greenhouse gas emissions are incredibly flawed. And it, it gives us enough to plan it for to, to some level of planning without over-reliance. So there are four, I think, I could be wrong with the number, permanent traffic counters in Northampton. Pioneer Bay Planning Commission takes the traffic counters, takes the traffic counters throughout the entire valley. They take the census question and ask, what's your journey to work? Based on that, they do a travel model of how many trips there are. Based on average fuel performance standard, they tell us how much gasoline is being used for them. 
it is like 10 steps removed from reality. We have no way of judging of getting any better data. Like, you know, we can spend a lot of resources. Let's go back to the question. We can spend a lot of money on greenhouse gas emission inventory. We're still not going to know how much fuel is really used by Northampton residents for travel. And so what's the point of getting better in some areas if you don't have that? Well, if you're using this like a beacon relating to the last conversation we had about focusing on what we have direct control over versus the broader impact yep. and emissions, you know, there's a, most of these things are out of our direct control. So part of my thinking reading that plan, that what kept coming up is like, well, how do we change the market? How do we change how people make decisions? How do we change investment? Absolutely. Okay, all these things outside of our direct control. But I mean, not looking at these exact numbers, but just like as beacons, like you're saying, like generally um, looking at this graph, it looks like we need to focus on what we have less control on, which as a commission we haven't been doing because right, right. so, you know. I agree 100%, which is why I, I so much push back on metrics, because we don't know some of the things we can do. We don't know exactly what the numbers will be, and maybe that doesn't matter. You know, We want to get as many rooftops with PV on it. We could project what we'd like to get, but I'm not really sure we can do that. So I think that's part of the conversation we have to have about how important that is. So I agree, absolutely, we need, to, we need to do a lot of that. So that's sort of the next slide. So this is sort of the above. So we just put these in boxes. So this isn't <clears throat> metrics, this is exactly what, but this is important to sort of think about these are sort of the, the five big boxes that most things fall under, right? And, and we're doing a lot of stuff. So for transportation, we need to think about, you know, more fuel efficient vehicles. We need to think about electrification of vehicles. Electrification being a thing with which this committee has been involved with and Chris has been very much involved with. We need to think about carless options, which has been the major, one of the major efforts that my office has been involved. The whole reason for Valley bike share and, and bike and pet activities is to give options for people for transportation. So transportation all fits into that. Land use is incredibly important. This committee hasn't so much been involved with that. That's more a planning board issue and, and city council. But how do we get some more trips? I mean, I can have an electric vehicle in a zero emission home. And if I have to drive five miles to work or 10 miles to work, I can have a bigger carbon footprint than somebody who could walk there in a leaking house, right? So we, we know that energy use, you know, transportation creates a lot of energy use, both directly through transportation and indirectly through more roads and more runoff from the roads, all those things we have to deal with. So that's part of the thermal loads, again, both the efficiency and decoupling, you know, the decarbonization. Um, the electric loads, so that the community choice aggregation part is part of this, the electrification, the efficiencies, all as part of this, I think it's an area that's been very much in, in this committee's involvement. Uh, and then the natural systems, which has been less, you guys, so, so Lily talks about that in terms of trees. Um, we've gone, you know, when, when I got here, we had about 1,200 acres of open space that's permanently protected. We now have about 4,500 acres of open space. Uh, and so we've started guaranteeing carbon sequestration, sequestration, we're trying to restore those things. So all those are, are part of it. We're just sort of beginning to think about how do we get more carbon into the soil as well, because the soil holds more carbon than the earth's more carbon the trees. So these are sort of boxes that we're fitting into. And again, I want to think about, you know, we need things in all of these categories. Um, some of these come in this plan, some come in the comprehensive plan, but a lot come in, in the weeds as we go forward. We're not going to ever do a plan that goes through each one of these things in the detail that we're going to be needing over the next 10 years. Um, and so, you know, I just chose the mid case, but one of the things we asked the consultants to do is give us this called a wedge diagram, right? Here we are today, tell us what are all the steps we can do to reduce, to get us down there. And for the data that they had, they were only comfortable projecting to 2030. There's too many unknowns. They wouldn't talk about that beyond that. And for the budget we had, to some extent the data they had, they just felt like they could focus on was it six, seven items um, there. And everything else was sort of, we just don't have the data, you know. And, and some of this was, we don't have the resources for it. But some was, we were making up numbers. Um, and, and so this data, color data, I think is, we could, you know, we could have it. They gave us a low, a mid, a high projection, all of which has to do with how many resources we throw out of that stuff we can do estimates on. Um, but there's a lot of stuff we just don't have the data. It's not about the amount of money we spent. You know, there's, there's how quickly, you know, what are the national standards? How are we subsidizing electric cars or not? Are we subsidizing rooftop PV? Um, how much are we willing to tax ourselves? And so 
in, in some ways the frameworks may be more important. And so we've been thinking about sort of what are some of the frameworks. So right now when Chris or I or any department have put together a budget that's for a durable item, that, that, so durable being it has a lifespan of five years or more for over 10,000 or a value of over $10,000. Those get funded from our capital improvements request. We make a request to the mayor, goes to the capital improvements committee, then it goes to the mayor, and then it goes to city council. Um, and right now, it asks us each of those requests, what's the effect on city staff going to be? What's the effect on future maintenance costs? It doesn't ask us what's the effect on climate change fund. And so, to me, this is the sort of framework stuff that's more important. Is I can't tell you when the fire department's going to buy a new fire truck, and I can't tell you if there are electric fire trucks or not. But so there's lots of unknowns. I can't tell you if an electric bus is realistic or not. But I can say, how do we shine a light so every conversation about new school to hard buses? We say, is that electric or not? Does it make sense? And that, I mean, again, that's what I think came out of the state of Northampton is the focus on that and the less actions that we can't envision now go forward. So that's the first one, the capital improvements filter. It's really important. We spent a lot of money in capital improvements. Um, and the other things that, you know, we spend more money in non-capital improvements, but the non-capital improvements includes things like staff, right? Staff is sort of neutral from a climate change standpoint. So the big ticket items are often the, those big capital improvements. Boilers, new roofs, envelopes for buildings. Those all involve capital improvements. Um, and then sort of the second one, again, obviously the mayor has to agree to this, the council has to agree to this. In, how do we think about every single action from a climate change view? So I went through, this isn't a criticism, what I'm about to say, but this is for the framework. I buy land now and council always asks me, hey, can we do any, can we put any housing on a corner of the property? You know, we buy, we do a lot of limited development projects. We buy 100 acres, we carve off four acres for buildings. And council says, can I carve off a few building lots? Can we carve off a few affordable building lots? That's been part of the conversation. Council hasn't asked me so far, what's the effect of climate change? So for Pine Grove, the effect is we have 105 acres we're buying, about 80 acres of it is not woodland. 10 acres are gonna hold site for agriculture, so that's 70 acres we're gonna restore, and we can do the calculations for you know what's built out for that. How do we look at every action that comes before council and every action that comes before the mayor and says, you know, what's the effect? Without knowing up front what those metrics are. The five focus areas I just talked about, you know, sort of thinking about all those things. And then one that's still in its infancy, this isn't just in the United States, the Carbon and Neutral Cities Alliance is looking at this, but how do we do, because I don't, I, I hate sounding a broken record, but I don't think we can do some of the metrics. I don't think we have the data. But how do we force those metrics out to different departments? So right now, every department does a budget, an operate an OM budget, ordinary maintenance budget, and they do a capital budget. How do we have them also do a carbon budget? And there's sort of two models that cities around the world are developing. Um, one is tell DPW or tell planning or tell, tell central services, this is the amount of carbon you're allowed to emit in 2020. This is allowed you're allowed to emit in 2050, zero. And you figure out the best way to get there. Um, because they're the ones who know their operations. Um, so, you know, it may have been this example before, but maybe there's a bulldozer that's all electric. But maybe that's absurd. Maybe instead there's 100 acres of open land that DPW could plant trees on. I, I just don't know enough of their operations to do that sort of metrics. I don't have any kind of budget. I could know their operations. But I trust them to be able to do that stuff. So that's one approach is giving them a carbon budget. The other approach is basically tax them, right? We've talked about carbon taxes. Basically do an internal carbon tax. DPW, you can use all the carbon you want, and we're gonna charge you X dollars a ton, and every for every ton of carbon you're emitting is coming out of the bonuses that your staff gets. Um, and you know, you can buy nicer office chairs if you can reduce your carbon faster. You know, that thing gets incentivized, gets done. So either one, and again, this is an infancy I've been involved with Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, who's sort of playing with it, so I can't tell you there's a methodology. But I'd say every larger city who's committed to, to carbon neutrality is focused on carbon budgets. And so that's sort of the, that's the approach I'm pushing. I think that's where we get the bigger return. And the concept's easy. It's still a lot of delivery for, for doing it. Um, hey, hey, oh, sorry. Yeah? 
I, I just wanted to flag the time. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So two more slides. Okay. Um, so you know, so this is again repeating it, but you know, what we always try to do in plans is think about what's aspirational, but also what's achievable. Right? We talk about four A's in planning, but so we want things that are really pushing the limit, but things that we can achieve and not just feel good. And so I want to be careful to feel good. And so this is the conversation we had before. We just there's a lot of things that are beyond our control. Um, including some of the borrowing, the buying decisions that, that you know, our residents make in the process. Um, and you know, and ultimately, this is sort of my, this is my last slide, but you know, we want to have this vision, we want to figure out what we can control, this is what I think Aiden was saying, what are the things, what's our vision, what are the things that we can control in the public realm, we can control some things and don't control other things, and what are the things we could potentially control in the private realm, and what are the things we can't, right? So we can incentivize, we can require private people to do some things, we can't stop them from buying their boxes from Amazon or doing their long vacations. So with that, Wayne, I want to bring up right now that, um, I mean, what I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong out here, that I'm hearing that there are uh, individuals with a lot of comments to bring out. Um, and I'm hearing there might need to be a discussion around metrics still. Uh, I mean, you've given a presentation on where you stand and, and there might be that conversation. We have about 20 minutes. Even if we had an hour and a half, um, I'm not sure we could do that <laughs> because of the number of comments. Do you have a suggestion on how to move forward to well, get input? In? Yeah, I mean, I think in August when we brought this up, we sent email comments. I've gotten yeah. some comments and haven't others. In September when there wasn't time in the agenda, I sent email comments. So I think we just, we'd like to get those comments. We'd like to get, start going through them. So I'd like, you know, sort of global comments. I'd like to get a sense of, to what, I mean, ultimately the planning board has to decide what they adopt and don't adopt, but to what extent do you all agree, you know, there's sort of deep, detailed metrics. I'm arguing for bigger framework stuff is more important. So weighing in on those things, it's important before you. Okay, um, uh, hang on, I just wanted to say one, um, I just lost it, go ahead, I just lost it. Well, I, I would just not characterize my uh, request for metrics, I, I think that it's, they're useful, but um, I think that laying out what we truly think is achievable uh, in this document uh, so that it gives the city guidelines is uh, an opportunity that we risk throwing away with the document that we have in hand. And I think that we can, this committee can, can do a great deal to make it significantly better and I would like to see the opportunity to work with you on that. And I think that working together, we will create something that will have a lasting impression that you guys have already spent all of this time and effort. And I, I build documents like this. I understand what an undertaking that was. That is an incredible undertaking that you guys have achieved. What I'm saying is that let's not rush it through right now before we have the time for the community and the people who, who are part of this community who really and truly care about energy and sustainability who are sitting in this room right now to, to weigh in and, to, uh, on how to make it. So, so we don't have to rush it out. Fine to do that. I, I guess I just want to come back to, we've been working this for a year and a half and I haven't gotten those comments yet. And when I look at, I mean, you know, look at Sustainable Water Hampton, look at the places where we went you know, we, we got to that level of detail, and those weren't the things that have influenced public policy for the last 11 years. Look at the framework things, I think those were things that have influenced it. So I want to, uh, so the piece I about to say, this before, is that in the past we've had some, some people say that they'd like to have a uniform, you know, a uniform input from the Energy Commission uh, to you. I can't see that being possible. So I want to make sure that's not, I mean, I cannot see this commission coming up with a, we agree this is our input to wait. Are, are um, we allowed to share comments among each other? We're over meeting well? Um, you just can't um, comment on it, right? No, you have to be careful. We can't we can't collaborate or discuss particularly on actual materials in any way that might violate open meeting law. If you're deliberating, particularly as a quorum, two people can, but they can't start sharing with everyone else, not outside of the public. We can share, but you can't discuss. So you can CC the commission on common sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you, we, well, it, that gets tricky too, so because that's question. that is a form of deliberation that's not done in public, but in the public uh, arena. 
So that's that's the trick with the overview block. So what you what you could do is everyone could send their comments to Chris if people have comments. And Chris can go away actually or go away, away directly. Yeah. yeah. May I say something? Yeah. I think there's real value in this commission having some unity in in your recommendations and it's work and it takes leadership but it can be done um, and what we did at um, in the tree commission is a couple of us work together to draft something to really deep deeply dive into it and draft comments at the next meeting we shared them with everybody we refined them and then we voted to approve them as the official comments of the public shade tree committee and i think that there it carries more weight i think that what what you're asking for is comments from individuals which is not going to be held in with, with the same sort of weight the same sort of gravitas as as a um an official position okay, so, so taking that taking that i'm just going to present that i'm just yes i'm going to say um I don't know. I, I, I guess I just wanted to say that I'm feeling a little bit frustrated because I feel like we are slowing things down and I understand everybody's interest in giving feedback, but also just historically before you join the commission, we have been talking about this plan for months and months and months and Wayne in fact gave us a deadline about when to get comments to it and all of that. I understand that not everybody did get their comments in and it's true that we didn't set up a process by which we would all kind of discuss them um, but I feel like we're back at square one trying to figure out how we're going to influence this plan and it's pretty frustrating to me I got comments in by the deadline it, it, um, it would have been great if we could have shared them with everybody um, and maybe we should still kind of add on a month or two and do that but it really be everyone to actually sit with this plan and go through the 90 pages and write down your comments and then we can come up with the plan but I just feel like you know this is what happens like all of a sudden it's going to be published and people are like oh but I didn't get to make my comments but we have been talking well, about we comments. just we just had a meeting where we expected to be able to make comments and instead listen to a presentation about them about what we had already read. Except it's so been on the I agenda not, for three months now. Right. We've talked about it. So, so, that's, 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 so when I are going to get to right. comment right. on it, because I have to go. I'm going to I'm going to suggest I'm going to make a suggestion along with what Willie is saying. That way, you've received comments from several of us, and you're about to receive comments from a few more. Are there a few members of this commission who are willing to take all those comments, the comments that came from commission members, and by next meeting? Put them together, compile them, put them together, and try to you know um, organize them into a a, um, a comprehensive or not comprehensive, but a kind of collaborative um, uh, input, and then bring that back to the next meeting as one set of comments. Does that make sense? It's kind of what Willie just said the, the the tree commission did. You know, I could see that being bounded. It's something that we could have done by next by next month. Would, would that work for folks? And we're allowed to talk about it it's a small group it's a work group yeah yeah two two people work on it and aggregate the remarks and comments and share with them in a public meeting that's fine two people could i mean it's two people you don't want more, more than the quorum more than yeah but, quorum, but, uh, but for this six. body as big as it is well, it could be more people than that that's you're what thinking about the council no that's what i'm saying no that's but i have just saying because Aiden was asking for a couple less people when that work so it could be up to five yeah you can be up to five right Right. We have to five people as long as they don't share with others about it. It's a lot of that. I wouldn't be compiling all the comments we received, which is from this group. Right. Putting in a document, filtering it out, you know, by the sections that you were identified. I'm not looking to restructure it, just focusing in. I, I feel. You know, I apologize. I have to leave early, and that was part of my haste this evening. Um, and I'd let you know that uh, I would volunteer to join. Okay. Thank you. Wayne, would that work for you? Yeah, it's fine. I, you know, I, just, I think we ought to be careful in uh, being consistent. I mean, you know, I think my frustration is it was a process people were sending comments to our consultants, you know, and, and they were the ones who were complying with this. Right. You know, right. But, um, yeah, I just don't have time to start. Right, when's the next meeting? Um, so we start. Kind of, the election. kind of giving a broad comment. I, mean, I, I was kind of taken back by the format of this, I mean, it was very comprehensive, but there's you know, even that wedge diagram, it's like there's these policy general recommendations that the the actual greenhouse gas emission reduction is based on action, not the policy. And I, I just sense some kind of disconnect 
It's like if you have this mandatory disclosure for large buildings in a wedge diagram, it's like that's going to result in this. And it's like, no, actually the action is people, uh, property owners and investors prioritize making energy retrofits for these buildings. And it just, it just seemed like there was a disconnect. I'm, just, I'm trying to keep this big picture. Yeah, yeah. There's a few few themes that it just seems like like a, a, a quick brush over not focusing on the action that's needed for the actual reductions. And there's big challenges there. Right, right. So what I would like, that, that topic specifically would like to be like, the city needs to do more to drive energy efficiency investments using carrots and sticks. Here's actual ways we can do that in the powers that exist now to change behavior. Right, but again, the question is, do you want to, I mean, what's the benefit of going so deep in the weeds? So, because you know, let's say we want to do electrification of buildings. There's lots of ways to get there. Mm -hmm. Do we have the data? Do we have the priority? I don't, I don't think it's, it's that deep. It's saying like, we can use zoning in this way, right? There's like a, a tool we already have. Um, here's, um, you know, in terms of vehicles, like a, a, an idea Andrew Smith brought up at the, the climate change, like charging people who drive bigger vehicles more excess tax. Like it seems like here's a tool that we can use to change behavior. Like th like specific, uh, those are specific policies, but like we're just looking at the tool, like use zoning to X, use tax structures to X. Uh, like, so, I mean, some of those things are limited by what we're actually allowed to do. Yeah, exactly. I don't so know what those things yes, are. A city, city cannot impose a tax. We aren't, well, we, there are certain local option taxes, there are very few of them that the state, all of that the state enabling law allows. Mm -hmm. By and large, we can't, we're pretty limited that. We're limited with uh, more offering more carrots and sticks in most zoning prospects and stuff too. So, that, um, the, so I think you know. To Wayne's point is, we we dis, we describe it. We're we're actually trying to define cloud, make it a little, give it a more more brighter lines, so that we can figure out what we have within our agency, our ability to affect law and or whatever else, whatever other policies. Can we move towards those objectives as opposed to defining how we're going to move to the objectives in the document because. What you said, said actually is right. That would be great, except we can't do that. So as we have to functionally eliminate each one of those things, you're coming up with a solution that we can't affect is the frustration. So the, the but as Wayne said, there are other ways to get there, hopefully. There are other, other avenues that we can use within the, uh, the within what we're allowed under, under the state constitution, so. Or, or using like that wedge diagram, like the, the energy building disclosure, like I don't see that doing much at all, getting us down where they present there, because how many buildings are that big? And what does disclosure require? Disclosure doesn't result in any action. You know, like what is, what is the disclosure? I mean, ha having a shopping list of things that are worth considering is fine, but I think you don't, it always costs you the, the path dependency stuff we talk about. You don't want to say, here's the route to go, because we don't know. We know that we need to electrify buildings. We need to make them more efficient. Mm -hmm. But we need to bring in some players for the zoning discussion, both lawyers and planning board and other people. We need to bring in some players for you know, lobbying state legislature. Just, there's different players who wouldn't be a part of it, and so I don't think it's useful to go to them for. I, I guess going back to Chris's question of what works, it's, I mean, certainly compiling questions is great, but if it's policy recommendations without doing that kind of research, it doesn't, it doesn't really, I mean, unless it's listed, we should explore this thing, that's great. But if it's saying we should be doing this through a zoning solution, for example, it may or may not be legal, I think it's that useful. Right, because zero energy code, like we can't just have a zero energy code right. because we don't make building right. rights. Right. It's like also, so that is exempt from a lot of, Smith that has large campuses, is exempt under the Dover Amendment from a lot of oversight that we can that we can normally impose in other entities here, but not not an education. So, so when, when when you get comments from us, whether it's a group or individuals, um, and uh, you know a comment basically I can't do that, you know law doesn't allow me to do that. You you are you comfortable if you know that well enough that you could basically set those aside? Yeah, that's the easy ones. The the things are a lot of things I don't know. Okay. Take more, yeah. you know. So you know we require PV ready roofs, for example. Yep. We think we're on the margins of what we can get away with for zoning, but we there hasn't been litigation. We don't really know some of those things. Right. So yeah, the things I happen to know, that's not a problem. But I just don't know. Yeah, the other thing I'm going to bring up too is you know one of them that you had up there was the um, uh, you know, 
uh, energy use um, disclosure. Um, you know, you're saying you don't think that will uh, affect what's changed. Well, actually, it needs to be all buildings, not just large commercial buildings. Like, okay. You know, to change action, you need to go much more, much more aggressive to change people's behavior. Okay, and at the, at the meeting we were at this this week, and Wayne was a book that you know, the, the, the network room meeting, right? There were people that were expressing the belief that energy disclosure does nothing. Mm -hmm. it, you know, Boston is basically saying we can't say we had a law of disclosure. We can't say it did anything for large commercial buildings. Yeah, for large commercial yeah. buildings, right? So, so it's like exactly we don't know. So you know, yeah, some of those places are things that are also we don't know. Um, um, so. And that's why I come back to sort of. Every time we do something change, every time we lobby, you know, we're going to be yeah. voting for ICC. We want to make sure that, that that's when we do that sort of analysis for each one of those. Things. And, I, and I will say, when the Sustainable Entertainment Plan came out right before I was hired and before this commission actually was was made, and we came up with a list of everything that the commission was supposed to touch, um, and there were a number of things that simply it's not going to do it. This doesn't make sense. You know, yeah. this isn't is not applicable to us, but. What we did have was this was the this was where it was trying to go with that, and you could do it this way instead, and you know the city would would take that on. So you know the direction was as way to say the direction was easily as important as the specific um, a piece that you're looking at. Um, so if we call all the comments, and I, I'd love to be involved in that because okay. like, we put all the specific recommendations in a blue box, you know, like, and here's an example of maybe potential specific recommendations. Here's the big picture following the structure that you already have. Towards it's like a logical way to Yeah. Towards that you and Gordon have stepped up so far. I guess so. Yeah. Everybody else want to join? Yeah, be great. Okay, naturally. Okay. So the three of you um, can work with Wayne to get the comments from the commission. Yeah. And they come back next month. Yeah, just that. can people send them to the three of us? Yeah, I mean some of us have already sent them to Wayne. Our comments have already been sent to Wayne. So, you know he probably has all of them, and some people aren't even here, so you know, maybe he can just forward them on. The ones that came from the commissioners, just forward them on to you. And if members of the public don't add to a quorum, I'd love to be part of that, if I could. Uh, they don't. The uh, members of the public can participate in any small committee meeting. Uh, they're not voting members, but they can certainly participate in the conversation, That's a great. discussion, and contribution. Yeah, I, I, I do have some concerns, though, because you know, we sort of set up this public process, we're planning on the public forum and process. I sort of, this is the committee's time, being a, a public process going forward. Yeah, and you know, all we're doing, Wayne, is taking individual comments and trying to organize them. Right, but I'm saying in terms of the public, nothing gets slowly, but I sort of think, oh, I this is the committee's time, where we, you know, there was there was a lot of public comment before, kind of where we hold this public hearing. Involved in a, in a committee, in committee work? A absolutely, but, I, you know, then I want to open up the entire process again, I guess my concern, we, you know, there was this process that was fairly done, you know, you, you've heard me say this before, this is the equity piece, we keep talking about equity, we all say we believe it, we spent $20,000, I'm not, I'm not sure the number, doing outreach to low-income individuals, doing focus groups with doing it. Unless you're going to reopen that process, I think it's not an equitable process. But isn't our comment just part of that puzzle of those other public comments? I, I'm not saying we're the not, I'm saying sort of opening up to other people on the same Basically, by have, allowing non-commissioners to have part of this process, it's kind of like opening up a public process again. But our but, comments... Well, in, in Lily's case, Lily is a member of another committee that has already Presented. Yeah, but the right. comment, yeah, I'm this, and I'm not bringing in the tree committee's comments. This is me as a citizen, member of the public, wanting to support the work of the Energy Commission in See, in in yeah, this you particular can submit, matter. You can submit writing to any public committee and under any circumstances. I'm actually so. talking about having conversations with people. Yeah, the different. I think I mean, what we're trying to say is is, is uh, to uh, take part in the process of of organizing these comments and not providing new input. Might be impractical, it may, it may not be, uh, it may be a little ingenuous to say that you're not providing input because you can't help but provide input when you help organize something. Uh -huh. um, uh, but is that what you were saying? I mean, that's what, because you provided input already. Through. Yes, no, it's not about providing input from via the tree commission. It's about be, me being a member of the public supporting the work of the energy commission. Separate, um, separate from my my role on the tree commission. It's, it's allowable. I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, it does muddy the waters a little bit because you are contributing. You're not 
you're not actually, it's, you're not supporting, you're contributing in that respect. So there's an emphasis on those words. I, personally, I, I, whatever document comes before us on the 14th, we would debate and vet regardless of who submitted what or said what, we would, we would discuss it regardless. It's just, uh, the, the, my only concern, I'll be frank, is undue influence by one individual. But it's, it's allowable. So, but with that caveat, that one individual may actually have more influence than others. It's, it's just that, you know, so I mean, that everyone understands what the service is. I think you're overstating my influence, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be dealing with some really strong, mm -hmm. strong, uh, um, free thinking people. Well, I, I so absolutely I, agree. I'm just saying <laughs> your influence is much greater than the four people sitting behind you. So you understand my <laughs> Thank point? Thank you. <laughs> and, and what I'm saying is that, that, that you, you, it's just so that we're aware, you know, and they're aware, and that's. I think that's the. I think that's a principal concern. That's all. Yeah. And I'm. And I'm not. Okay. I'm you gonna. From it, so. I'm gonna throw out another suggestion. Yeah, Lily. But we are down to actually your yeah, time. Now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, but I. I do want to. I do want to end with one comment in that, you know, this this work is so serious and it's so urgent, and we don't really have time to dicker around a lot, and we need to get really focused, and we need to get. We need to use data to drive us. We need, we need to be making precision decisions very quickly. Um, so I, uh, my interest is in helping to move this forward and, um, and not uh, you know, subverting or uh, in any way stealing power. It is to move this forward. I think it, personally, I think it comes down to whoever is part of this group that's putting this together they can decide what kind of input they want from whom at this point. Just like when the city council is working on an ordinance, I've worked with community groups that want to give input. I, as an individual counselor, work with people who are interested in the issue. I totally understand what you're talking about, that you want to provide access to everyone, and that certain people do have more time and whatever else that gives them that access and other people don't have that same time and space to, to, to access their city councilors. But the bottom line is, if, if there is a citizen, a resident, who is interested in contributing to a process, and the people working on that process for the government want to interact with that person, it's really up to them to do that. So that would be my kind of take on this piece. But I, I actually, I don't know, are we ready to transition away from yeah. this? Because I want to talk right. a little bit about the metrics question as a broad. Yeah, I have a broad question too. Oh, did we, did we agree that Lily can then. be a part of this group or not? It's, I mean, uh, yet she but is it's a not by law. part of the group. It's okay. a matter yeah. of she uh, can talk to them and they can let her access them okay. as they want, I would say. I, don't, I think forming it as a group also could be potentially a subcommittee, which would be a violation if it isn't public meeting. That, you have to be careful. But yeah, mm -hmm. Sharon and Adele could participate too. So yeah. And we're going to take the lead on it, the three of us. We're going to form that. We're going to own the Google right. Doc. We're going to take the existing comments. Um, I just have a short handful that I haven't submitted, so I'll include those, and then we're going to organize them and not rewrite. I think Gordon's comments were pretty strong. We're not going to rewrite anything. We're going to compile and offer a comment. Just yeah, bring, it, bring it here to us on the 14th, and we'll, we'll yeah. deliberate and figure out what we can, in the aggregate, figure out what we can send on. Yeah, and I think Lily is involved in it. Um, I mean, she's going to both provide input on that big picture structure. I don't see anything wrong with that. No, it's perfectly fine. It would, it is no small task, but good on you. Yeah. Appreciate it. It's so. going to be complicated. Yeah. 90 pages and like okay, every with page that comments. Time wise, we are now at, we're now at the crux. Because I did, like Lily wanted to give you five minutes, but I actually think the metrics thing is important to talk mm -hmm. to you. Can, yeah. Can, can you, while you take time to switch screens, yeah, and and here here if this if this feels like the most important task of the of the commission right now, I can also do this presentation next month. Would you prefer that? Yes. There you go. <laughs> That's what it feels like right now. Okay. Great. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm thinking about the uh, sustainability and all kinds of pieces of it. When you talked, Chris, about it, how you know something clearly became not doable and all of that kind of thing. When I have looked at the plan and I've seen a bunch of stuff that didn't get accomplished, I'm kind of like, well, you know, I, I don't know what the internal process has been. Have you gone back on, on 
annual basis or a you know semi-annual or something to look at what has been done and what hasn't have things been checked off. So thinking about that, that what feels to me like a, a kind of um, lacuna in the in the process with the sustainability plan, I would like to have an eye with this resilience plan and the sustainability plan that gets written in 2022. Um, that if we can create metrics because it feels not doable for a bunch of reasons that you mapped out, which I respect, um, at least we could create a hybrid of something like metrics and review. And the review piece to me is, is lacking overall in this document. So that what I'd like to see is with all those beautiful tables and charts, that there are timelines at least. So in one, in one year we're going to check, have we actually addressed this? You might not be able to put a number to what your goal was and did we achieve that goal, but at least you're looking on a regular basis at every single task um, within a particular timeline. So it's not metrics in the classical sense that you know we are going to have 90% of the roofs covered with roofs, roofs, is roofs a word? Roofs uh, covered with PV, but in three years we're going to check, in six years we're going to check you know, what those percentages are. So we're at least, I mean, I'm just kind of um, stunned that we are, we're not able to provide some of the metrics that the, I understand the complication of it um, to the mayors, whatever it's called. But I, I feel like if we don't build it in, we don't build something in that is a hybrid of metrics and a timeline with specifics around how we're checking up on each of the tasks, they're not gonna, we just don't have any oversight of this plan. So I would like to see something built into it that, that holds that kind of hybrid model of metrics and timeline. So going on straight, um, so uh, I wanna make sure people are clear on something. I think what Wade is talking about, I believe the uh, uh, conference of mayors, their metrics are uh, greenhouse gas emission inventories. Uh, greenhouse gas emission inventories are very hard to do and they're very inaccurate. They're really not worth your time. Um, so the big picture of where is our green, I mean, we could do all this work and you're going to be pulling data from the state level and it's going to be irrelevant for what we are. So I, I totally agree with Wayne that that kind of thing doesn't make any sense. If you want to look at it and say, um, you know, in year one, uh, you know, uh, count up all the roofs that are facing south enough to put solar on and then the metric is to put, you know, X number of, uh, that's the kind of thing you could do. You know, you could put that kind of metric in. So I think there's probably places where you, you, you probably could have metrics. But just to respond um, to that, I think if you build into that that kind of hybrid metrics thing, yeah, something like um, on an annual basis you're collecting this data from the state yep. or from whoever actually. I'm, holds I'm not disagreeing with what you said. You're creating before. the mechanisms by which you're collecting the data on a regular basis, so you have it at your fingertips when you need to aggregate it and yep. analyze it. Good point. So that's that's what I'm suggesting we do with this timeline kind of thing. Okay. And I was adding to that is that you might want to consider in some places where it's like we know we have. Uh, we, we know we can collect, collect metrics on this one, so maybe this one we want to put metrics on. I'm just throwing out that as a suggestion to think about. And then the other one I'm going to toss out is that, you know, with Cambridge experienced, um, uh, it's, it's sometimes really hard to measure metrics and percentages down, you know, changes, slow changes. It's really easy to measure something in an absolute. Um, no more city bur buildings burn gas, you know? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Boom! You just don't burn gas anymore. That's it. So you know, having that kind of metric, I think, might be something to consider as well. You know, by this date, we want this absolute set. I don't care how you get there, but that's what we want. You know, that's our goal. Is that you know, some big picture ones, um, uh, an absolute. Type but big picture ones are great too, because it's in the weeds where you get more and more uncertainty in terms of what you do, and I'm not sure there's a lot of benefit to doing it. But I think the big picture stuff, absolutely. Are we currently tracking by department, like miles driven, things like that? And is that part of the putting on us on departments to report? Yeah. I, my department is not. I don't know the answer if anybody is. I have, I have a, hmm. the question went out today. Is that be easy? I mean, gallons, gallons purchased of fuel also must be a line item in a, in a No, it's um, the, uh, the old uh, DPW handles the gas distribution, gas and diesel distribution to city vehicles, all city vehicles. And their old 
gas boy system just didn't have the capabilities to provide this kind of data. They're putting a new one in. Unfortunately, I didn't know they were putting a new one in until the decision was already made. The question went out today to someone at DBW, can this new system track miles? Can this new system track fuel efficiency, et cetera? So I'll get back to you. Um, I'm hoping that if they put a new system in, any new system is going to have that kind of capabilities. You know, it seems like that should be pretty standard in a gas distribution system for a city at this point. Um, but the reason why is that, you know, if you're, getting, if you're picking up gas with your car, if you're an individual, if you're driving five different vehicles, then you can't track it. But if you're, you know, if the, if the okay. track department, you know what department you're in. Yeah, but you have to do it by vehicle. You know, I mean, you really have to do miles and gasoline use or diesel use by vehicle. I'm not sure. We're not sure if they'll have the capability to do that tracking with DPW. So I don't know yet. But we did not have the capabilities in the past uh, because of the way the city managed it. You know, it could have been gasoline by department, but that doesn't help you. If, particularly, if you got 12 vehicles in your department. You know, it doesn't help you. You're making a budget. It's like uh, you're, you're you're not getting in the weeds. You're broadening it out, but still making an actionable metric where you say, you know, by department, here's your your allotment. Yes, you could do that. Yes. Yeah. You could you could do something like that, yeah. If, if we're done with Andre, I just would be really curious wanting to get your pulse on sort of how you're reacting to the comments about the sort of framework's lack of urgency around you know, 2030 and hitting like really significant yeah. reductions by then. I mean, you've heard that comment from people on the commission and from several others, and I, I haven't heard you react to it yet, so. Yeah, to me it's the achievable versus aspirational. So, I mean, I share the urgency. I just think, I, I don't think there's gonna necessarily be the financial resources to do it. I don't think it's gonna be the state and federal policy choices for you. And so I, I'm concerned about setting ourselves up. But I think we should be as aggressive as we should can be. I don't think we know how far we could go. Um, and I, so I think full metrics become false metrics. I mean, I love metrics when we know what we can achieve and can't achieve. But it's, I think there's so many uncertainties into what's actually doable. It also depends on the kind of landscape at the state level and the federal level in terms of incentives and money. And if the administration changes, we get someone who's really, you know, that could shift a lot in terms of what the state, the city can access and not access to, to meet the goals. Yeah, it just seems good. like to have a, uh, um, our most aggressive pathway not even being on par with the IPC's, IPCC's recommendation of we need to get 45% reduction by 2030, just Well, that was, that, you, you, that was a production, a, 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 a number that came out of the, the, the finite ending or the, the irreversible, irretrievable right. end point. And so that, that defined the aspirational goal. In the meantime, the federal government is now allowed uh, the reinstitution of incandescent bulbs. It's reducing uh, uh, regulations on, on uh, I mean, yeah, but we're not Hampton, like that's not aspirational no, 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 for North Hampton. To it's me, true, aspirational is like we, 65%, like because we can't, a but, minimum viable plan. Well, no, no, that's the thing is, I think that that because the larger influencers, I think, was the original discussion is it's something that we have limited options to control, so that forces us in order to meet those standards to be even more, more draconian and figure out. And, and as I said, short of instituting actual laws where we can actually enforce with individuals and commercial enterprises how we can limit them and make and force them to comply in order to meet our objective of 2030, um, which we don't. I mean, I, I think what I want to emphasize is that the, 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 the amount of authority we have is actually hyperinflated by many people in how it's perceived, how, how much we can actually affect. And as I said, you know, what we're allowed mostly, by and large, is incentives as opposed to, to sticks. There's not a lot of sticks that we can offer because for, uh, lobbyists have been very effective in working in establishing state and federal law. And in fact, they can be more effective in reversing any benefits that we start to work towards and any, any achievement that we get 
we can feel good about it and we do feel good about it and we should be as aggressive as we possibly can. But the fact, I think it's, we have to look at the fact that we, uh, I think every document should emphasize the 2030 date um, to suggest that we're going to hit the 2030 date here in Northampton, I think might be delusional. I, I mean, this the way I, I support that is, I, mean, I, I agree totally in theory. I guess when I think about sunk costs, I and mean, if you look at us around this table, or city boards, everybody, and say, how many people have fossil fuel driven cars or fossil fuel heating, heating systems um, who are, who, how quickly can we get rid of those? And, you know, we have a lot of sunk costs. I think we have less control. I don't think we're going to have, like, my next car will be pure electric. Or maybe better yet, I won't have a next car. Um, but I'm not actually going to throw out my Prius, which I was so proud of getting 10 years ago when I bought a Prius. Um, and I think that's sort of across the board. If we're really talking about where are we in 11 years, given those sunk costs, we're not going to be throwing those things out. So, you know, Chris got the mayor to, to agree to support that as we do city heating systems, we're going to be going to fossil fuels. But we're not at the next level of throwing out the fossil fuel systems that are perfectly workable. Um, well, actually, at some point, you know, this steam boiler that we just put in that, you know, may last for 30 years, um, with the mayor's policy in place, I would say that if you get to the point where you can do the other improvements to that building before that boiler is at the end of its life, there's no reason not to just get rid of it. Yeah. You know, so, but that is going to be really difficult to get citizens to do that, to get, you know, residents to do that, and to get businesses to do that. That's really hard. I, and that's where I bring the social equity piece, what has to be part of us and the goals is 45% of our population is rentals, renters. You know, are we really, are we, are we facing up to that part of it? Um, most of us, not, not me, but most of us still drive to work. And so I just, there's so many, there's so many steps involved. So that's the pessimistic in me. I don't disagree that we should be doing it. And I think there's, this is a problem being local is that we have only so much control for doing it. It's about behavior. And I mentioned that earlier. And it's because we don't have a lot of control with our sticks. It's like we have to change people's behavior. We all know that. And then, so it's like changing the conversation like is, is it's so hard to drive through downtown. Is that a bad thing or is that a good thing? You know, it's like, how, how are we impacting? It's the culture, you're right, to change the culture. And, and, and I would give you an example. Uh, 25 years ago, everyone smoked. You smoke in a restaurant, you could smoke on a plane, you could smoke wherever you wanted. And people did want to smoke, had to be relegated to some quiet place of shame. And how much over the course of essentially a generation that has shifted, but that was a large comprehensive effort globally that actually pushed it. I see something similar here. I don't think it will move fast enough. I don't think it's, if, if we use smoking as an example, um, but again, you know, something profit and corporate driven that actually was inflicting a poison that actually affected the, the country. This is, this is a slightly heavier lift with larger, more influential corporations are uh, arguably, but the culture did change. And I think in Northampton, the increased awareness and discussion and activism is is very effective. It's not an epiphany though. Things don't actually change with too quick enough, in um, particularly in this circumstance. And it is it's to our eternal frustration. But the fact is, is it, I mean, for some people they would say, oh well, then the hell with it. But with us, that's not the case. Ours is to say, all right, we need to tilt at this window because this, we have no choice. Yeah, we have to move the markets in the way that we can. And, it, and, right. and to the extent that we can influence yeah. that, yeah. yeah so yeah, like, yeah. you know, like Louis is known as like a strict enforcer right. of the building code. Like, exactly. that's great. He's using the tools he has to move the building market. Exactly. You know? and then like, exactly. And to this point, one of the comments that I made and that I know this group made, can, I think, and some people from the community made is that one of the things that felt glaringly um, necessary in this plan is much more focus on public education and figuring out how to actually give people the tools to be different, to act differently, to behave differently. So that's something that I'd like to see really woven through the entire plan yeah, yeah. more. And, and do me wrong, I'm not trying to be a defender, I mean, we had consultants who wrote this, I'm not trying to be a defender of the plan, it's the deep in the weeds stuff. So talking about education is really important. If education was how many hours of education in the curriculum, 
that would just be, that wouldn't do any good. But I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to, there should be a lot of plan, changes plan. I'm not trying to say that there shouldn't be. It's, it's how deep do we go in things that we don't know about. Um, and how to utilize the people. I mean, that's a comment that I made at two or three meetings ago when we talked about the plan is that it talks about, you know, the curriculum for kids at the high school, but it's from the high school that we have all this energy and all this knowledge more yeah. than even, you know, some of us sitting at these tables. And it's so how do we actually utilize community members like teenagers to create that shift? And that's the piece, that's the kind of behavioral piece um, that I think is missing to some extent well, from the plan. I'd like to I see built in more deeply. Sending consolation, this is the, the, the major moving force and discussion point in youth division. There's now 25 members. In fact, I don't know how to corral them, but they're, they're, that, that is the thrust of their ambition, that and getting the right to vote. Municipal, so that actually would have culturally have an impact. But so so we go to another so, meeting. It, yeah, it is, it is after 5.30. Um, uh, I actually do want to add to Lisa's uh, comment there, is that these plans, do they ever say hire someone new? <laughs> You know, we were, we sort of talk about having more resources for doing it. You know, I, I'm cautious about what do we influence within the city as well. You know, so I think having more resources is absolutely one of the things we have to talk about. Yeah, Whether it's consultants or grants. Right? Because just from my opinion of being, I mean, I'm probably the one person here from the city who's actually has any part of my job description is to, to influence the public. Right. Yeah. And. I am lucky if I can get to a program every two years, yeah. you know? So, and I have, I've said for a long time that I actually think the city needs a public face person. You know, they need, they need a public, both to brag about what the city has done and to run public outreach programs. You know, they need someone to do that. And it could be more than just energy stuff too. It could be, you know, health and safety. I, I guess health department does some of this too. But anyhow. Well, the mayor's looking for a new chief of staff, and he was sort of just going to shake up the office a little bit. I would recommend that you suggest that be a dimension of that position. There you go. It almost reflect on the, the this friction in this process as a reason why you need more resources. It's not a recognition out of in the plan, but like because this process seems to have so many sides to it, and it's bumpy and metrics. You know, there's all there's there's so many depths to it, and that's why we need more help with it. Yeah. That, yeah. It is after 5.30, so I guess. I thought it was a very healthy conversation, and I will second the motion to adjourn. Okay, all in favor? Oh, you. Yeah.